Good evening. I am Michonne Benson, an assistant professor of African American literature at Texas Southern University in Houston, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us for this critical and timely discussion. Before we get started this evening, I'd like to acknowledge the Rutgers University Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Equity, Justice, and Leadership. And I'd particularly like to thank Dr. Mary Beth Gassman, the executive director of the Proctor Institute, and Brandy Jones, director of programs, for their support of tonight's event. Tonight's discussion, Reframing Black Art, A Matter of Social Justice, features a group of remarkable people representing two or three generations of fine arts professionals. I admire each of them for their significant contributions, not only to their respective communities and to the art world, but also for the unique ways their work navigates and corrects the social political context that has historically shaped domestic and international public pedagogy, specifically about why and, black, why and how Black Lives Matter. Panelists who are here tonight have been selected in part because they are talented artists in their own rights. However, I also felt it important to expand and challenging the academic space by featuring artists who may not be yet as visible as Lorna Simpson or Carrie James Marshall or Simone Lee, some of the more notable uh, members of the arts community, um, but who belong in those same spots and who actually occupy the very spheres in which some of the most um, recognized artists occupy in a, in a lot of ways. Over the last two months, I've interviewed these artists about their formative exposure to the arts as well as their current projects. And I hope that each of you will take the opportunity to view those interviews on the Proctor Institute website and to also read the essay that I authored that serves as a springboard for today's discussion. Without further ado, our panelists are going to introduce themselves. Starting with Ms. Mrs. Michelle Barnes, who is the Executive Director of the Community Artists Collective. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to share um, the work of the collective with the broad audience associated with Rutgers this evening. I am co-founder, executive director of the Community Artist Collective. I'm also an aspiring artist uh, as a professional. Um, the collective has existed since 1987 and has created opportunities for especially emerging African-American artists, mid-career African-American artists to exp have a venue have a, a home place, a safe place um, and space to create um, the kind of work that they would like to do to show their work, to curate, to expand their professional experiences, um, to teach, to share not only their work, but um, also work that is consistent with the values um, of our cultural community. What you're viewing are some images of our programs in our space, our current location, and some of the artists and audiences that have shared the space with us fairly recently. Thank you, Ms. Barnes, for that. I'm sure that we'll talk a little bit more about the, um, the activities and the exhibits that the collective is, um, is presenting this month and in the near future. Um, Dr. Trotty, we would like to continue with you. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Certainly, I'm happy to be a part of this panel, this uh, great panel, and to join in this discussion. I am retired now, six years actually, from Texas Southern University, Department of Visual and Performing Arts. But I always said I was a consummate volunteer. And so I am very much involved with the Community Artists Collective, co-founder and board member currently still, and with the uh, Rutherford Beach Yates Museum. And uh, cultural history has always been important to me. And I just enjoy being engaged and learning new things and sharing what I know and supporting the community. 
And so all of this is extremely, at this point in my life, uh, current and viable and the kinds of things that we should all be engaged in. Thank you, Dr. Trotty. Mr. Early Hutnall, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Early Hutnall Jr. And I am a photographer in the city of Houston. I worked at Texas Southern for 43 years, and I have been documenting the third, fourth wards primarily here in Houston. I love communities, who we are and what we do from day to day and how we live, special holidays. Those things are important to me. The camera is only a tool. It's up to the viewer to come to his or her own conclusion once they look at the image accordingly to what, how they feel and what they have felt and uh, it's up to them primarily. Uh, I'm thankful for this opportunity uh, through Michonne and Rutgers University to be able to have an opportunity for a larger audience to see my work. Uh, I have been photographing and documenting the Houston wards and wherever I go especially small towns, small communities for over the last 40 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hutnall. We look forward to hearing uh, about all of the work that um, the community work that the collective does, as well as the significant contribution that Mr. Hutnall continues to make to the arts um, through his exhibitions in, at the Smithsonian, to his influence, as we understand, via a recent Time Magazine article, uh, he actually influenced the Academy Award-winning cinematography in Moonlight, the film Moonlight. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Now we get to some of the youngins. Um, <laughs> so starting in alphabetical order, starting with Nathaniel Donne. Uh, they, that, that younger part is starting to fade, but uh, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, how, how is everybody doing? And I want to thank everybody for, um, thank you for inviting me to participate because uh, I think it's a necessary conversation. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Donne, and uh, I'm a Houston-based artist, but currently I'm a, a second year last year, uh, Yale MFA candidate in the painting and printmaking department. And in terms of my practice, I'm interested in um, theoretical and practical notions of blackness, black social life, uh, everyday aesthetics, and music or musicality as, uh, as frameworks to um, question our um, being and uh, relate, relating to race, um, also relating to class. Um, I'm very interested in the use of material as a uh, way to also not only like represent or show representation of, uh, of an idea, but also consider uh, the imagination and transforming like the material that could, you know, refer to our, um, the lives that we used to have or thought about and show like uh, a new way of seeing a deeper, deeper way of, uh, considering uh, meaning. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much about it. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess, oh, so these images, basically was just a project I was doing. I'm, I'm sure we'll probably get into them uh, later. So. But your art does, I mean, to, well, some of the conversation that we'll have certainly is that a lot of your artwork and, and a lot of those of your peers, the works of your peers, span the gamut, right? It's not just about the work that's on the wall, but it's also exactly. about the work that you do in the community, in the classroom, and so forth. So yeah. uh, that's part of the larger conversation. Right. Community, awesome. uh, definitely coming from community and speaking and, and collaborating with community is, uh, is probably the, prim is the primary thing for me. Mr. Flowers, I'm sorry, alphabetical. Oh, okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Lance Flowers. I'm a visual artist and audio artist. Uh, I'm from Houston, and I've been working for 12 years as an artist professionally. I've worked with some of the panelists here, like Nathaniel. Uh, we'll also be on a project that I believe 
will premiere on uh, what is that? Is that a twenty fourth? Right? right. Yes. Uh, which is basically the project of Robert Hodge. Uh, it's a great project, and uh, Nathaniel. I'm glad I could actually see you and talk to you. It's been a while, but um, yeah, uh, I work in visuals, mostly collage. My work is about capitalism. It's about, of course, the black experience, um, primarily in America. Uh, I have a story duality growing up one part in the ghetto and then one part uh, having like uh, a lot of educators and uh, I would say people with higher education in my background. So that's it. I, I hope we have time to get into it a little bit further. Thank you for having me. We will definitely talk more about Friendly Fire, Robert Hodges. Um, exhibit at the Nation Museum. So um, I look forward to extending that conversation. Next, we have Mr. Ricardo Osmondo Francis. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for taking part in our presentation this evening. And thank you, uh, fellow participants. I am so excited to uh, just some of the work I've been seeing. I'm just amazed. Uh, like half of you all I know, and the other half I definitely wish to get to know more uh, as we continue uh, with this. Uh, I am from Third Ward, Houston, um, grew up in the Third Ward, um, and I've known Michelle and Dr. Trotty for as long as I can remember, and definitely uh, not only going to HSPVA, but um, I got a lot of my training as an artist from uh, from Michelle, especially at the Community Artists Collective. So uh, kudos to the collective for being in my life and helping me to uh, be able to survive as an artist here in the New York area. Um, I've been in, I currently have my studio in Newark, New Jersey. I, I am with the Leonidas uh, Arts Gallery in New York. I'm their gallery director. Um, and I exhibit both in Texas and Houston and here in the New York, New Jersey area for the most part. Um, and my work is mainly about showing people of color as human beings, showing them beyond the facades that people think that we are and just seeing the soul of, of what we are as human beings. That's my main uh, impetus of what I do. Um, I love cla classicism. So a lot of what I do is uh, inspired uh, from that. Um, my sense of uh, polit uh, politics is very subtle in comparison to uh, a lot of the artists here, but um, I think if we're going to, as in the state that we're at right now, uh, if we're going to change policy, we have to learn to hear and listen to each other. So I hope that through what I do as an artist and as a curator, I do that uh, through my actions. Uh, and to self-plug myself, at the present moment, there is a virtual art project entitled We the People. It is to inspire everyone to go out and vote and to be politically active in their uh, communities. You can go to www.wethepeopleartshow.com. The show went live virtually on uh, Monday, October 12th, and will be up until uh, Election Day. So please go check that out. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. OK, Anne, you're next. Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ann Johnson. I'm glad to be here, especially in the company of so many great artists and this strong Houston presence, which is I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, the love in Houston, the way we support each other. Um, I, first of all, I'm an educator. I teach at Prairie View A&M University with all these TSU Tigers in the house, but it's okay. It's HBCU love, it's all good. Uh, <laughs> but um, I've been uh, teaching at Prairie View for over 20 years, started in fashion. I teach in the art department now. But as an artist, um, when I first came to Houston, a uh, person I was interning with drug me, he said, you gotta meet Michelle Barnes. And he took me to the collective and then 
we've been joined at the hip ever since. Um, she's been a wonderful mentor, Dr. Ward Lousy in here, Dr. Trotty, they've all been wonderful mentors to us in our community. As an artist now, uh, my emphasis is experimental printmaking. Um, I print on just about anything except paper. Um, the work is, some of it is ancestral, genealogy, politics, but it's certainly race-based because I have affinity to create work based on my community. And as, as of probably the last five years, a large portion of my work, I've used my creativity as my activism. And, um, and that's one of the questions I'm sure we'll talk about moving forward. But um, I'm, I'm glad to be here tonight and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Next up, uh, alphabetically, who's that? Um, who was this? Michael Khalil Taylor. Yes. Last but not least. Uh, hello, my name is Michael Taylor, and I am an artist and educator, an uh, interdisciplinary artist. I've known everybody here on this panel for no less than 10 years, and for some more than 20. Um, which is totally surprisingly awesome because um, I had nothing to do with who's on this panel. <laughs> um, but it's, it's good to see those relationships kind of blossom and continue on. Um, and uh, I guess my practice now is largely a kind of remixing of reality and remixing of institutional structures. So like this piece right here is called the Alchemist Archive. And it's basically dealing with the lack of transparency and how archives are formed and how history is canonized. Um, and it's enacted with uh, glass, charcoal, projections, performance, like a couple different things to try to activate that conversation about what's included and what's not. Um, a lot of my other work is looking at whatever is there and just thinking about how it can be restructured or reimagined. Um, I also do that with my own work. So this is a remix of the piece that was previously displayed um, in a site specific manner. Uh, my practice includes everything from drawing to painting to choreography to video. Um, it's just kind of an exploration of possibilities and a refusal to accept uh, whatever is considered uh, the standard norm of possibility. Um, just just in a, a note, um, Ricardo and I went to high school together and I actually just found out that we both share uh, studios, or we both have studios in Newark, New Jersey. You, you, are you on the third floor? <laughs> are you on the third floor? I think I may be on the third floor. Okay, well, Project for Empty Spaces here in downtown Newark, we're getting a lot of new artists here. We, uh, the, we used to be in the, um, if you know downtown Newark, which most of you all probably don't, but maybe some of you do, but um, it was in the Gateway Center for years, and now we're on Broad Street, uh, and I love the new building, and I, I honestly have not, I, I need to know who's my neighbors, because usually when I'm here, I just go to my uh, studio and and just get, get to work, but I'm glad that you're here. We, we've got to uh, touch base. Naturally, naturally. Yes. This really is a, a family reunion, a, a homecoming of sorts. So um, I'm really glad to see that the panelists are making those connections. And I'm hopeful that by the end of our session together, that lots of other of our viewers will begin to make connections and establish relationships that uh, might prove fruitful in the future. Um, I want to thank all of my panelists for being here, all of the panelists, not mine, uh, and to welcome our guests, our other guests who are viewing. We have just a little bit more than an hour to spend together before we open the floor to take questions from the audience. And I wanna leave the discussion with a quote. We're just gonna dive right in. I'm gonna withhold the name of the author and the date for a moment. It does not follow that if the black American were better known, he would be better liked or better treated. But mutual understanding is basic for any subsequent cooperation and adjustment. The effort toward this will at least have the effect of remedying in part, in large part, what has been the most unsatisfactory feature of our present state of race relationships in America, namely the fact that the more intelligent and representative elements of the two race groups have at so many points not quite, uh, I'm sorry, got quite
quite out of touch with one another. Um, how long ago do you think this was pinned? Does anybody have a guess? Anybody on the panel? This is not a gotcha moment. This is a get to moment. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> no, it's a get to moment. <laughs> I'm just, I'm gonna let you off the hook. Almost 100 years ago. It's an oh, old story. Really? Old story. I was gonna say the 20s. Right. I was thinking that too, actually. This quote, uh, Elaine Locke penned this in his seminal essay, The New Negro, in 1925. So almost 100 years ago. And it's still, it's prescient, right? Um, so the question here is, in 2020, how does your work capture or address the more intelligent and representative elements of Black life? You know, in the face of all of the WAP, thank you, Cardi B, and, <laughs> and uh, what was it? Uh, Megan the Stallion. I can't forget Houston, <laughs> right? Thanks to them. In fact, in 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 the midst of all the barrage of images that we're constantly fed a steady diet of, um, especially during the pandemic, we're captive audiences to a certain extent. There are there any aspects of your work that absolutely counter those less than intelligent aspects that could be attributed to black life and how might that be the case the word in intelligent is throwing me um yeah that's very subjective um mm. and i think that each of us is creating work that counters stereotypes that counters indignities, inequities. We're dealing with um, in kind of a, a snapshot fashion because except through film, do you get that expansion of time? But in a moment as expressed through individual work, otherwise are honest expressions of our perception of our culture slash race. Yeah, and I would like to add that when I read that statement, I couldn't help but think about the uh, sensibility uh, in the past when we talked about the talented 10th, we were looking at the educated and the quote unquote non-educated and I, I don't feel that that exactly, well, not even exactly, that that fits today's concept of where we are with art. I think there we are more in the sense of commonality and our concept of why art is important to everyone. And it's a much more inclusive sensibility in the, at that point. And we are dealing with the fact that our consciousness is what we are expressing. And that consciousness, consciousness is not limited to any particular category of people, uh, whether it's economic or education, but we all have a voice and we all have something to say. And I think that that's what's more important today. Yeah. Okay, I see Anne and then okay. Nathaniel. I, I just wanted to say, because you mentioned Megan Houston H. Now and Cardi B, and some of us in here, at least I can speak for myself and Nathaniel, we're first generation hip hop. I mean, when I first met Nate, he was a graffiti artist. And I think you could embrace pop culture, but you don't have to like everything. You can kind of flip the script on, on it. You know, you can add aspects of it. I do aspects of the language to my work. And even if it may be conceptual, you know, I, I agree with Michelle, I think intelligence is a tricky word. You know, it's how you embrace the work. And as a creator, how you embrace the work and then produce moving forward. I, I, I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was just gonna say a couple of things. Um, I think one of the things is what's important to to note is that um, time and making making things are, are 
forms of expression in that time has has to be has to be you have to be very careful and not necessarily uh, picking up uh, an idea from one time and dropping it into another time because those 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 time frames are different. Those uh, the purpose the purpose of the the statement is different. Like you know, and and what the goals were are different. And I think what happens is there is a unintentional um, el elitism or exclus exclusivity that that happens as a as a as a as a consequence. You know. Of, of talking about different, talking about a singular type of intelligence. And like through time and over time, we start to understand, you know, through just life or, 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 or studying or whatever, that there are types of different types, there are different types of intelligences, right? Like, uh, you know, you have musical intelligence, there's a, there's a uh, intelligence in terms of like spatial intelligence, all these different types of intelligence. But I think the, the, the thing I want to really emphasize is that um, I think the idea of uh, blackness for me is the nuance. And so like what, what I'm interested in is like the nuance and the in-between spaces, not the binary of like good or bad, because we know the, the, the human part of us is good and bad in a sense, you know? And I think that for me, blackness is about plurality and multi-meaning, uh, multiplicity, and, um, and variedness, depending on context, that kind of how you move throughout the space or whatever. So I think that's, I think that, I mean, I can, I can respect this statement, but I understand that that statement has its place. And but let I think, me clarify for a second though, Nate, let me clarify, because yeah. I don't want us to go down a road together where we're anti-lock or anti, you know, the time period to a certain right, right. Like I, I understand his references, um, certainly, as um, as Anne alluded to, the reference to the the talented tenth or to Du Boisian thinking. At the same time, intelligence for Locke had a lot to do with uh, his observation of lots of Black people from the South migrating north, and for the first time coming into contact with each other and learning that Blackness was more than one thing. Right. And so for him, intelligence was not necessarily a matter of what society had deemed good or bad, acceptable or, or not, but what black people themselves were learning about themselves and that, were, that they were incorporating into their own practices of being. So if as a, as a sentient being, as somebody who understands who is intelligent, right? I have an intelligence. It doesn't mean that I'm formally educated because I, my grandmother, great grandmother, was certainly more intelligent than I in so many respects and never went to college a day in her life, right? Had very limited formal education. But she had a horse sense, a community sense, a common sense that is not so common now. And I'm wondering how much of the common sense. I think that that's kind of what Locke is getting to. How much of Black common sense that is often overlooked by mainstream society or that's often devalued by, you know, certain cultures that are not Black, right. how much of that is functioning in your work? I guess I should have... Right. Well, that's what I was going to say. I was going to say you, you, could, you could leave that there, but you can also pick it up, right, and go forward. So that's that's what I was going to say. I'm not I'm not anti like at all. You know, what I'm saying is that we that my my point is that the intelligences that um, that do exist as creatives, like what we do, is go beyond the literal or the surface space, and we open those other spaces up for those things to become visible. Those type of different intelligence, that type of what you're talking about like the commons or even the undercommons, you know, the, the, the very um, everydayness that we, we look at. And then what we find is a circle because the circle goes back to, for example, if you are an admirer of Pablo Picasso, for example, and you love Cuban, Cubism or you are interested in modernism, right? And this is a big thing. Well, the circle actually starts where Picasso goes into Africa 
and gets inspired by West African sculptures. So that's the, that is the beginning, right? And that is the thing you, un, you unlock, you, you, you expose, is what I'm saying. So that, that was. I like that play on words, unlock. I like that play on words. Okay, I think. I like, can I add something? Yes, Ricardo, let me, let me tie in uh, Mr. Hudnall because as one of the elders, he may not, he may not volunteer. He's, he's very shy these days, but um, <laughs> look, the, 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 con the connection to, uh, to Nathaniel's point, to Mr. Hudnall's work, right? Um, the intelligence in that's beaming, and this is, this is um, the, to counter Jefferson. Those of you who have not read the essay that's on the Rutgers website, I started with Jefferson. But if, if as Jefferson said in the 1700s, that black people are not, not only are they not attractive because their faces are veiled with an immovable blackness, right? So there's nothing beautiful about them, really. Uh, they're, they're, they, you know, uh, the orangutan might find them appealing, but that's, that's about it. Um, the, the intelligence that beams on the faces and the eyes of the subjects in Mr. Hudnall's paintings and the thread of the everyday, again, um, to use your word, Nathaniel, in boys jumping on the mattress or the cowboy painting or uh, photograph. Mr. Hudnall, you're capturing every day, you know, what have you observed about the ways that black bodies you know, what, what kinds of intelligences or common sense understandings do your photographs portray, you know, about the everyday? When you see, what, what, what have you learned from the bodies of the subjects in your pictures? Well, uh, you have to look at the soul of a nation, the exhibition. I think that speaks for itself about Black people. And if you will observe how the various artists came together with their different ideas and their various collaboration and how they, their, you know, their inner thought. You know, art takes one outside of time and space. And all of this coming together was a true kind of expression from them. As in my photographs, I try to capture life as I see it and the expressions of people as to how they exemplify that. I think that is the richness in our culture and how the exhibition Soul of a Nation came together. I think that was a good example of how versatile and how rich we are. And that in itself allows other people and other cultures to explore and to come up close and to get an understanding as to how we tick, how we interact, and how we communicate with each other, and how we communicate with our own inner spirits. All right, uh, Ricardo, thank you for that, Mr. Hernal. I saw um, Ricardo's hand and then Michael Taylor, and then we'll move on to question two. Uh, my, my response to this, this uh, statement is pretty simple. Uh, I'm going to piggyback off of Dr. Trotty. I believe that each artist figures out what their message is uh, through the dedication to their work. Um, and the work itself does all of the work for you, really. I mean, in terms of identity. Uh, I mean, with what I do, I don't think it, I, I think by the time I hit 34, 35 years old, the work made sense, finally, in terms of what direction it needed to go in. And it being able to, throughout all the noise and all of the perceptions that people have about us, I felt at that time, finally, my work was able to really speak without me having to say anything about it. And that's each artist's journey on their own. They have to figure out what they're attracted to, what makes them want to do the work. Um, and that's a very abstract thing. I don't think you could put words really to encapsulate all of that. But um, for each uh, artist of color, I know it's a different journey in comparison to say our white counterparts in many ways. However, though, it's still the same uh, discovery of figuring out what our message is supposed to be and that's something that is indescribable, I think. 
so I agree with this statement though, because I do believe that why I think this statement is important in many ways is it's the thing of being taken seriously. I feel like this is what this statement is really trying to say. And right now we're in a moment finally where I think that the world is taking black, not only black people, but black creations a lot more seriously and with a lot more respect and a lot more attention. You know, I think that in some clusters of people, of other groups, they took us seriously, but it was almost like a kind of like, well, we take you seriously, but in the public sense, maybe not so much. And now uh, it's all we're we're all we're on TV. Our message of uh, Black Love and Black Lives Matter is out there. I just hope that. As people look at our work, people look at our stories, people look at our history, they take off the, pro the, the perceptions that have been there for many generations and finally look with a, a fresher lens. Mm -hmm. okay. um, like if you look at a Titian painting or Velazquez painting or even a Picasso painting, you don't look at it the same as you would say uh, listening to a, a Langston Hughes poem or a a Ramari beard and collage. You know, I feel like all of that stuff means the same thing. It's a human uh, expression. The people are different, but it's the same emphasis on trying to express something from something else, from a higher consciousness. This, I, that's how I see it, rather. So that's my answer for that. <laughs> okay. um, uh, Michael Taylor, and then Lance, I'm going to start question two with you. Okay, so uh, Michael, go ahead and, and uh, contribute to this first question. Um, so at first I was thinking about how it related to right now, but now I'm thinking about how it really doesn't. Like in, in the sense that like a hundred years ago, it was probably this idea that if like different people just got to be around each other, everything would be resolved. Um, and I'm thinking like how many of us are, are reaching and, and finding spaces in which we're able to have conversations, interactions, with people from very different backgrounds and there's still something that doesn't make everything automatically in touch just from our presence right like diversity didn't mean equity like it didn't mean things were balanced out it didn't mean experiences with each other would create some sense of humanity not not just because of that so i think in my artwork i'm trying to figure out what's what's more powerful than exposure what's more powerful than uh opportunity what's more powerful than diversity um, and trying to see whatever is invisible. Like, what's the invisible structure? How do you disrupt the invisible structure? How do you um, how do you remix that structure? How do you claim that structure? How do you claim it, release it, and then go claim something else and let that go too? So I, I think for me, my strategy, um, and it is very strategic, and I'm going to say that word strategy and make sure I point to Nathan, who just happens to be over here, because he's one person who I remember specifically talking about strategy to navigate through these spaces a long time ago like with Monopoly boards around or something like that. I remember that. You, you remember that, right? Okay, so I never forgot that. I never forgot that somebody brought up to me that there had to be strategy, but the strategy is also in the artwork. Um, so it's, it's taking things apart, putting them back together. But for me, I look for the intelligence that's oftentimes uh, not acknowledged as intelligence. So like when Nathan is like shooting the elbows and the white walls on the rims, right? Like there's something very intelligent and beautiful about adorning your car in that manner, right? Um, that what happens when you take that form and you use it for something else, right? Like everybody else's artwork comes from different forms and we just kind of accept that as like some standard. Um, so what does it mean to like not accept that as a standard? Like what if I'm about to WAP this art show? Like what does that mean if I take that idea of something being like undeniably enjoyable and transfer it to like painting colors or something like that? So I, I think that's where I try to play is to figure out what the intelligence is in different things and to like pronounce or acknowledge it um, through the artwork and the reference, referencing back to those forms. Oh, could I, could I jump, can I say something? Oh, no. Sure, sure. I, mean, you I, want just to I just want to say something real quick. I ain't going to take it all up. I just wanted to say that the, see, the thing is, the intelligence for me is the doing. The, mm. the thing you just said, right? How do I take this, do this, and do that, right? It is that, that is the intelligence right there. That is the, the, the thing that's, because the intelligence is not necessarily the material. The material thing is the consequence of the intelligence in action. And that could be a spiritual thing, that could be like being in the zone, or it could be like some kind of energy transference or whatever. 
or even cultural, like a cultural kind of uh, handing down, right? But either way, that's the intelligence, I think. And I agree. It, and it doesn't die. It, it, it's generational. It keeps, re, you know, re, re, regenerating, you know. Mm. I agree. Okay, so I'm going to start. Thank you for that uh, very much. I hope that we'll be able to spark some of our uh, viewers' questions. Um, but we're going to move on to question two. Former Rutgers student and chief architect of the Black Arts Movement, Amiri Baraka, transferred to Howard University early in his educational career. And as a group, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about how each of you consistently negotiates racialized spaces and the decisions that you make uh, in your own professional lives. I mean, what barrier will exist for you and as a professional artist, as an educator, as an administrator? And have you had to leave certain spaces where you felt that you weren't able to practice your intelligence? in a way that produced the kind of work that you knew you needed to produce? Uh, I'll start with Lance and then I'll go to Anne. Well, I think every Black artist at some point has been kind of like faced with the obstacle of how do I get my point across? How do I get my idea out there? When you're surrounded by, um, you know, a culture of putting us in boxes, keeping us in boxes uh, financially, as far as our creative outlook, you know, it's, it's very hard to sometimes translate what you want to say when the people who have the money and the people who control the certain industries of our outlets, uh, media as a whole, when they control all of this, it's very hard to get your point across or to express yourself in the manner that you want to. So uh, you do have to get creative. I've had to get creative my whole career. Um, I've kind of chosen to back away from galleries for the most part and uh, find more creative outlets. When I first started as a visual artist, uh, no gallery in Houston really wanted to show my work. They didn't understand the work. I've always viewed myself as a link between the past and the present and the future. And a lot of people just did not get that. It was, I don't know if it was too far ahead or if it was too controversial to, to mix the two, to have that synergy. So I, I had to find people that really uh, were more open and it, it wasn't always the best venue. It wasn't always the best money, but you know, eventually we went from sneaker shops to like last year we did the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco. So, you know, sometimes like, like what we were saying earlier, um, I love what everybody was saying about intelligence. Intelligence really is just about survival. And whether it's survival, you know, in the physical space or financial survival or survival of a dream, that's, that's real intelligence. When they wouldn't let me in, you know, as far as visuals, then I use audio to make it in, in certain spaces. When audio didn't work, then I use visuals. Mm -hmm. uh, Michonne, can, can I add that if we take a, a snapshot Let's just say over the last 50 years, there's been a change or maybe more acceptance of dealing with topics that are mostly concerned that artists of African-American descent are concerned with. Uh, we, we know that in the 1950s, it was hard to, for African-Americans to get into some of the museums. Um, even as late as I would say the the 80s, there were discussions about why call your exhibit Black Art? Why say this is exhibit in the title? Because that might discourage some people from viewing it. And so 
I know I, because I've experienced this with putting on exhibits at the university and being involved with exhibits in the other uh, community areas, that this concept has changed. But what has happened now, that people are more willing to look deeper and to understand that all art, it's not just because you're looking at the black experience, but all art has something to say and can dig, dig deep within to express that. And so all art, if we want to call it black art, is universal. Yes, it is. But it took using that title for a long time to get people to understand that we are trying to make a comment. We're trying to say what is important to our experience, to our communities. And now that concept is much more acceptable. We're beginning to see the opportunities to, to make that expression and to say it on Main Street. So we're, we'll need to go back and, and talk about how the uh, descriptor black, you know, in black art is functioning in 2020, you know, as opposed to how it was in the 60s or 70s, um, because I think that's an important point. Um, if previous generations of artists use that term and were discouraged or were discouraged from using that descriptor, then what kinds of lessons in the informal curriculum, you know, in, in public pedagogy, either within the culture or between cultures, has been um, has been taught about what it means to be black or to affix black to anything then you know but for just for this one just for this point to go to Anne's let's put a pin in that one and to go to Anne's uh, comment did you have a comment about this yes ma'am um, you know as it relates to barriers I have a couple of things I'll say quickly but for my personal work I don't let a space dictate my work either you want to show my work or you don't because if I give up to my philosophy or what I create to please them, then I'm already losing myself as an artist. So Amen. that I, I don't do. And, and I think we're, as we get older, even though we're the young ones on this panel, you know, spaces are coming to us. And that's always a goal as an artist. But I remember, I don't know if you remember this, Nathaniel. Uh, Nathaniel and Khalil and I were all at the Creative Capital uh, Professional Development Workshop. And I'll never forget this lady. This was this, she was this hip white lady and she said, I'm just gonna tell you the truth. She said, the art game is a rich white lady's toy. Their husbands needed something for them to do. You remember her name, Daniel? The, the husbands needed something for them to do and this is a game to her, but this is life for us. And I, I've never forgot that as, you know, you get older and you start to see the inside game of things. Michelle can preach a sermon on this, but, um, you know, getting involved with panel discussions you know, as a way of breaking barriers and getting on some of these exhibition committees and seeing how people are selected for, say, I'll just say, for example, the Art League or Londale in Houston. And when you're in the company of these artists and the first thing they say, because I know I was the only, I was on there, um, Nathaniel, when you applied for Londale, I was the only black person. And they all say the same thing. I don't want to push for my friends, but, but there's the barrier right there because they don't know you. And lastly, I will add is we got to get more people to write about our work. You know, that's so critical as an artist to have people to write about your work. And as much as I love Houston and I love this city, we do have problems with you know, getting critical discourse about the work that's created. Can I, can I add to this? Because I, I love, uh, Definitely what Lance and Annis are saying is so relative to the, the, the big picture of making it as an artist. And I want to say this too. I got to see Black people working together, making art through, at first, Dr. Trotty and Michelle Barnes. So being a Black artist now, it was sort of in my mind and in my system and in my consciousness already to know what to do. And when uh, something crazy happens or whatnot, you have to stand firm in your creation. You have to stand firm with your work. 
Not everybody's going to like it. Not everybody's going to understand it at first. And most artists, especially in this country, are going to go through that. Uh, it's just, you have to be, what is it, everyone think you're crazy or insane or they don't, they don't grasp it. But if you stand firm in your vision, eventually people will finally listen. It's hard to describe why that happens. But in, it's also just, uh, like Lance also said, you have to show everywhere. You can't just, you can't think you're going to show in a gallery only. That's not how any of this works. You have to show in a cafe. You have to show in a store. You have to show at a church. You have to show in a space that people want you there and people really believe in your vision, believe in your work. And you'll be surprised by doing that and continuing with that. You'll get the galleries, you'll get the museums, you'll get noticed and you'll get the notoriety and all of those things and all the trappings and whatnot, but you have to uh, go, uh, you have to work with people that want to work with you and you have to also be uh, a people person in many ways too. I feel like a lot of artists oftentimes, they, they hurt their own chances by believing that there's only one way or this has, to, I have to do this or that and the other. And sometimes you have to, uh, Coal, you have to work with people you don't necessarily like. You have to be in that show you don't necessarily like, but it's a stepping stone to the next opportunity. So I, I, I wanna encourage people to keep that into perspective. It's not always going to be the show you wanna do, but it's the opportunity that you wanna get and the visibility that you need in order to continue uh, flourishing in this career. Thank you for that. I, I want to make sure that I ask Nathaniel and Michael if they want to respond about their respective experiences in academia and in that space. But I want to turn to Ms. Barnes first to to talk with her as an arts administrator um, and, and the, you know, talk to some of the difficulties that you've experienced, not necessarily over the 33 or some odd year experience, of the collective, but maybe most recently, you know, what what are some of the um, the obstacles that you're still navigating as a as a primarily African American community serving organization? You know, um. the field has changed a lot in the last several generations. Um, there are a lot more opportunities for the African American artist and others to show together, to show in different spaces, um, to be sought after, as Anne was indicating, by curators. Um, so there's the, the question of relevance of an organization like the collective um, in this changing environment that is more open now to the African-American artist, the images that are pre, uh, created, um, the abstractions, the, the, the work that's done with such integrity consistently. So what are we to do is the, the constant question. And we need the feedback from the artist whom we've served um, even before maybe they realized that it was necessary to be served and supported um, to find out and to guide the direction that we'll take in the future. I, I dare say that some things will not change. We will, we will need education formally, opportunities for education informally to exist for future creatives. We'll have to um, espouse a value for lifelong learning because of the lives that we, um, we live in a rather oppressive environment. So even though everyone has a creative impulse, it may not be pursued at a, a young age. It may not be until later in one's life that they say and recognize, this is important to me, this creativity. I've got to do something with it. Uh, it's in me. I want to share it. It's worthy. And uh, there needs to be support uh, for that kind of development and um, expression along life's journey. Okay, uh, 
thank you, Sparns. Either Michael Taylor or Nathaniel Donay, do you want to speak? You, you, you can refuse, but I know that you all are both. <laughs> 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 you may have some, some comments about your, your experiences. Uh, I have, there's, there's different, um, there's a lot of different ways to think about my experiences uh, in college, but I think one thing that's very interesting is probably the conversation I would think to have is different based upon the people who are in this room. And I think part of that is crucial because um, there are people here who I've known that I didn't know were going to be here. Um, and it actually kind of carries a lot of my because um, all in grad school most recently, um, and I think about my experience teaching in college most recently, um, I just now got to remember uh, that there's someone here who gave me a job teaching at U of H to young kids, right? And then I also got my first teaching gig from Michelle Barnes, and, uh, uh, and, and there's all the Blaffer people here, and all the, like, there's so many different people here, um, students, I went, like, there's a lot that you'll go through, but you kind of got to hold on to and grasp and sit in the things that nurture you and not the things that try to tear you down. Like nobody said it was going to be beautiful or easy or it was going to be your expectations. Like anybody who made those promises didn't know what they were talking about. Um, it's hard to navigate through glass ceilings and glass walls, right? Because you're going to hit them before you can break them because you didn't see them, right? And so they, they stay there. And if you go lateral, you're going to hit a wall. And if you try to go up, you're going to hit a ceiling. Um, and you get tired from constantly trying to break something to get through something. Um, and you make relationships and people see glass and they move it for you so you can transition. Um, but I don't think the goal, I, I could never tell anybody that this was going to be some type of journey that was always going to be pleasurable. Um, but there are lessons to learn and there are things to learn as an artist to do and to not do. Um, and I think the point that I'm at right now is that I more fully understand that in this very long game, uh, self-care and trust that you are in a process for a reason and in a context and that you know what you're doing even when you can't articulate it, like um, that we're forming a language, like there's the language between like black and POC folks where English just don't work. So we got to do something else. Like we got to bop some music. We got to make some paintings. We got to dance. We got to communicate in some language that is not English um, and it's not Spanish. Right. Um, and so with that thing, I think, I think not losing that as you navigate into all these different spaces, holding on to something that's authentic, staying connected um, and then have an opportunity to just be reminded of where you come from and the community that built you so that you could endure through that experience. Yeah, I, um, I agree with that. I think um, just in terms of, for me, there's a there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of moves and 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 things that I do to hold on to and maintain sanity, you know. And one of the things that I do is like, I do the, I do a, a way of leaping into the future and then looking back and thinking about um, being able to be comfortable with uncertainty. You know, I'm comfortable with knowing that stuff can happen and it will happen. I don't have to know tomorrow, something gonna happen, you know? Oh, it didn't, fine, that's, that's good for me. But when you, you, when you are able to understand that part and, and, and that part builds a lot of confidence, like in, internal confidence, because you are going, going back to the to intelligence thing, you're now, you're now training yourself to be able to improvise through all kinds of different circumstances. You, you're training yourself to be able to see what's not seen and then when you understand that this this life that we are living is 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 about the the journey through each stage, right? You you're going through each stage. You know there's there are moments when you recognize you messed up. There are moments that you recognize that you did something brilliant. There's moments that you recognize that you shared with other people, and everyone else kind of profited 
And I'm not talking about monetarily. I'm just talking about we, we, everyone gained collectively from it. Like this, this particular talk is a perfect example. So when you understand those things, and those things are not really reliant or rely on the exterior other than the context to bounce that off of, I think then you, you become more um, grounded in self. And I think something Cleo was talking about too is like, I think you need to, you got to find a friend or a family or a puppy or a cat or a mouse or, or a book or something to say, <laughs> you know, hey, some, this, this is crazy. You know, this is, what's going on is crazy. It's not like I thought it would be. I need to figure out, I need to go back to this thing, whatever that thing or person or idea is, sit with it and then come back, you know? And like, I think the last thing I'll say, because I, 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 didn't, I didn't necessarily go, I went through like this kind of questioning, but it wasn't like doubt. It was about, it was about questioning, okay, like I'm around what people consider brilliant. I mean, like, you know, around a lot of brilliant people. I mean, these undergrads, man, they go through books like, you know, a bag of chips, you know, and just boom, they got it. And I'm like, man, let me read that again. Let me, let me notate that, you know. But the thing is, everybody has a story to tell and every story has value, right? And every, and every one can bring something to the table. The thing is, if, if you respect yourself enough to understand that you have that value and you have that contribution to bring. And also just the last thing, you don't have, cause I'm, I'm, I'm big on this right here. Let me just say this, this, this I'm gonna cut it short. I know everybody, so this is the thing. <laughs> You're good. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not too big on letting everybody know everything. You know, I'm, I'm interested in refusal, like, and refusal not in a way that I'm trying to be uh, mean or condescending or whatever, but in re refusal in that the, look, the things that you don't know is fine. The things that I don't know about you are fine, you know? And over time, if those things are meant to be where we can exchange or those things are meant to be, then they're meant to be. But if they're not, then that's fine too. And, and I think you learn more when there is some kind of negation or absence of, of information because it, it, it requires you to dig and think deeper about your circumstance or, or, or your surroundings. So if, if there are people here um, that have issues with me, that's fine. I have issues with someone else, <laughs> you know? So that, that's the equal, equal exchange law going on, you know? So yeah, that's my answer. If, if, I don't know if it's- Special though, Nate, initially, that's all right, no, no, you, initially you made it sound like, I thought you were gonna we equate uh, black art with religious experience. That's where I thought you were going because you started talking about perseverance and building faith and stamina and looking back to no, well, build confidence for the future. Well, I, well, it is, it just, I just, you know, sometimes it takes, but I, I just wanna say like, yeah, black, one of my things is, and one of my interests one of the interests I have is locating all the aesthetics, not just singing, not just language, uh, even, uh, not even a, maybe even a color theory that comes out of the black church and Southern black church specifically. So that it was there, I probably just didn't articulate it, but it's, it's, in, it's already in, in the soul, you know, it's in, it's in. I hear it, I hear it. It's about the process, not the product. We're all working on our intelligence building it every day trying to figure out how to articulate it however we can okay we just have time for one more question i see that we're running out of time and i want to make sure that we have enough um time to field any questions so the one of the purposes for convening this panel was to um to join the conversation or at least to um to participate in the larger conversation about the fact that Black Lives Matter. Certainly we understand Black Lives Matter, okay? All lives matter, Black Lives Matter. Um, but in as much as we are also experiencing a pandemic and um, that children by and large are in their homes um, seeing, being fed a steady diet of protests and um, lots of images about black lives that supposedly matter, even though they're not able to get go come in contact with anyone, right? I mean, everybody's kind of sheltering in place and they're isolated as much as we are in these little boxes on Zoom. They're not coming in contact with real people 
who are living real lives. And so the majority of the images that they see and that they're processing are coming to them filtered through the media. And one of the things that black art does or has the capacity to do is to set things straight and to counter prevailing narratives that are very limited in scope in terms of black criminality, other stereotypical uh, images that have become archetypes in our culture, right? So I'm wondering whether or not we can all kind of make some summary statement about how it is that Black Lives Matter, not just that Black Lives Matter, but how do how does Black art demonstrate that Black Lives Matter for younger generations of people who really have not been exposed, who really don't understand what this is all about? How do Black Lives Matter and, um, and why does Black art contribute to that discussion? Well, as an educator and art educator, I, I had to uh, take a look at what our National Art Education Association states and what they're encouraging, what our, our, our youth are getting in the schools, uh, at least as a part of the curriculum. And I did pull a statement uh, May 2019, which actually was originally written in May of uh, 2015, then again revised in 2018. And it basically says that visual art educators are encouraged to have their learners participate in social justice, service learning projects, or to identify, create, and implement their own. These projects can help educators and learners bring about awareness of social justice issues, open dialogue, and identify ways in which the arts can impact efforts to address injustice. And I think our young people, many of them have had these experiences where they are exposed to more in schools or they're encouraged to be creative and to let those experiences come out. And they're more receptive now to hearing and seeing and learning from others. And so they're open also to expressing their own ideas. And we say that the young people are much more vocal and, and expressive and outwardly um, vocal, maybe, than we were as kids, because we were told to be quiet. <laughs> but now kids and young people can speak out. And I'm just pleased to see that the idea, the concept is not lost on this generation, that everyone is aware of and beginning to be more cognizant of and, and receptive to individual statements of culture, of growth, of ideas, and to give people that opportunity to be expressive. That's important. Any other comments from the panelists about how Black art might facilitate children's ability to process or respond to these, these images that they're getting or to contend with? Okay, Ann, I see your hand. Oh, I'll say this. I see your hand as well. Uh, piggyback off of, of Dr. Trotty as an educator. Um, what I always tell my students and even little kids, and, and I'll tell these parents who see these murals and things coming through, don't look at the work, look into it. Look into it. Um, there's a great mural right now that my sister, lovely Olivia, has in Houston. It's called Bloom for Real, right? It's not just about Black Lives Matter. It's about environmental racism when you look into it. And... Um, I mean, that's a whole nother panel, Rutgers. Why does Black Lives Matter in art? So, you know, we'll stay tuned for plan B. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think it's an outlet for the rage. It's an outlet for the truth as an artist. It's an outlet for activism. Everybody's not built to be out there in the streets. So maybe you can ch rechannel that energy and that rage through your artwork. That's what I tried to do, and it's hard. You know, I, I curated an exhibition called How Do I Say Her Name? Because I didn't know how to say it. And I realized that other artists felt that way too. So uh, to cut, I'll, I'll cut it short uh, in the interest of time. But use your creativity and use creativity as a form of activism. And just don't forget to look into the work and not just at the work. Mm. 
I, I agree actually with that. And just to continue with, I, I feel like our answers are all uh, interconnected to each other. I feel also each generation builds towards the next. And I feel that what's happening now, it's been building for many decades already. So this is a beautiful thing. It's, it's, finally, it's finally like really beginning to open up uh, where everyone gets to really look at not only, again, like I said earlier, they, everyone is looking at black people very differently, but also looking at everything that we're making, everything that we're saying and everything that we're doing. Uh, so I just say we should just continue, continue truthfully and honestly you know, we are, we're human beings just like everyone else. We have significant stories to tell from not only our own perspectives as, a, as an individual, but just, you know, as a collective. And we'll be fine. Um, I, I only see great things happening uh, from here on out for Black art and for, uh, for the Black voice, period, no matter what the genre is uh, in terms of making, making something. So I'm... I'm intrigued to see what happens from here on out with everybody and, and uh, all that's out there to come. Ms. Barnes and then Lance, did you have something? I think I saw your hand. Ms. Barnes, go ahead and then, and then Lance and then Michael. The opportunity to create is, um, provides a sense of freedom. We're not always um, responding to what somebody else thinks. We're not always having to answer to people's questions um, that they're, they're really going to have to invest some time on their own to, to seek answers to. Um, we use the art in ways that is a utility to ourselves, to our families, to our communities, and um, always put forward in an excellent fashion um, what we want to say, what we want to do, the legacy that we want to shape um, that will, that's based on our experiences with integrity and an eye for a, a hopeful future. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Uh, Lance. I, I just wanted to say, I think, um, Black Lives Matter through art because we we use our art, I guess, a lot of times we're put in a space where entertainment, art, what we create gives us value to the world, but we also use it as a way to communicate with one another. And a lot of times with younger generations, it, it's through the art that they realize what's possible how they can themselves like navigate out of situations or uh, be impactful themselves. And they can piggyback off of what's created. A lot of, a lot of times you, I, I talk to young people and they're like, wow, you, I didn't know you could um, use music in, in that way in a museum show. I, did, I only thought of it as, you know, trying to top the charts or you know, uh, sell merch or they didn't know like, well, you can use this also uh, as a platform to speak in a museum sense or a gallery sense, or you can get a grant or, so it, it's like we're, we're navigating, we're leaving little pathways for each other to find not only our voice, but also, you know, a significant living. And, and also, you know, um, leave something for the next generation to build upon. Thank you for that. Michael. Uh, so I, I guess I was thinking about the generational stuff also, um, in a sense that I think like I carry with me in my teaching practice to younger kids now, stuff that is actually like, I only know because of Michelle Barnes. <laughs> like, like, like if I throw mutual yeah. benefit as a phrase at you, I did not make that up or read that in a book. Like that was in a book of the collective, right? So like there's this intergenerational knowledge that like if you pass down, you did a good job. Like if you found a way to put it in an art piece or put it in a book or put it in a conversation, like you did your work, right? All the other stuff is like bonus. So like if my artwork can help somebody understand something or 
or like make connections, cool. But I'm kind of tricky around language, right? Because there's so much play in it. So like, if you say Black Lives Matter, like it's a statement, but it's also a question. Like I'm asking you, like, do you think I'm, I'm, I'm relevant? Do you think I'm valuable? And then you find out the answer. And depending on where you at and who you ask it to, the answer varies from all out violence to like a cosign or an acknowledgement, right? Um, and it's real simple. It was like if I said, um, I'm going to give everybody in here $1,000, the people who didn't get $1,000 would immediately say, I didn't get $1,000. Like if I responded, everybody got $1,000, they will once again remind me that they did not get $1,000. And so this isn't like a conversation or a nonsensical conversation. It's very normal for people who are not included to ask to be acknowledged and be seen. And we really get a real representation of the country that we live in when you see how much people will just fight to make sure that people remain invisible and don't have an equal opportunity. Um, and so I don't know if it's a question of whether or not Black lives actually matter or not in a sense that like we know it matters. Do we, do we want to keep yelling it, shouting it, throwing stuff? Like, do we want to keep making art? Like, how do we keep announcing our presence? Um, in ways that isn't just like our, our, our creativity getting commodified for profit for other people to build their nations on. Like. Um, can I jump in or no? Sure, no, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, so like, yeah, so like acknowledgement for self or acknowledgement for validation, right? Black life is supposed to be the first thing I think black life is a uh, is something that you owe for self preservation first is, is your life you know and what I mean on a bigger scale is like our life as black people shouldn't have to be um, dependent or presented in a way that it we have to worry about what the answer is. We just should do and should just be, and we should become. Now, the thing about black life and, and funny Cleo was talking about the trick in words because I think, and I know this may, on the, on the top, this may sound a little morbid, but it's not really. Like we talk about black life, but um, I think we should also talk about black death. And if you sort of kind of circle back to the church thing, like what does death mean in, in this situation, you know, like in, in, in these times now, how, in, like literally and metaphorically, like what does death mean? For me, death is like a way to really acknowledge, acknowledge a way to get out of or remove or kill the type of things that we've been kind of accepting or comfortable with. And in an art, in an art context, I'm thinking about ways to like disrupt our our way of just accepting our 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 being the our being in in association with the status quo right or just saying like well i want our black lives to matter i want to i want this to i want this well like no i don't maybe i don't want that maybe i want something different and maybe what i want that's different i don't want you to be the ones to frame how i want it you know, so I'm also looking at not just black life, but black death too, in that sense, you know. Thanks. I think um, <laughs> requires, as Ann said, another discussion, um, another set of conversations, um, because you, you all broached some really important issues. Uh, I want to open up the conversation now to address some questions that Brandy has fed me in the comments, some of which you all have already answered. One of the more recent questions, uh, someone has asked that the artist speak to the conscious raising capacity of art with respect to exploring the depictions that we lament, um, that we're sad about, that we regret, um, so that the images that must be redeemed and celebrated can be exposed. Let me repeat that. Someone wants to know, if anyone can talk to the conscience raising capacity of art with respect to exploring the depictions that we lament so that the images that must be redeemed and celebrated can be exposed. 
Can okay. I touch on that? Sure. Well, um, <clears throat> whoever asked that question is a genius. And I, I think my whole career has been about repurposing things. Um, hence, like some of the collage work that you uh, showed earlier, uh, taking, you know, elements of capitalism, taking boxes and bags that are, you know, luxury good driven and really cater to our more materialistic, primal instinct, ego driven instinct, uh, taking those items and then repurposing them to fall more in line and aligned with, uh, you know, Buddhist principles of samadhi and enlightenment and, you know, purity of heart, but also um, speaking to uh, environmental consciousness and how to, how to take items that are subsequently, you know, people, people take these items, stunt with them for a few, hours take dissect something out of these boxes and then throw them to the side and honestly like i i use i use these items because we get done the same way where you know people love our culture for a few minutes they dissect out of it and then they throw us to the side so um what they're saying i i guess what i'm saying is like i i with that question in mind all of my work is based on trying to raise the consciousness and raise um, the outlook by taking ordinary items that we, you know, sometimes we, when even mentioned in conversation, I guess around intellectuals or those who are more spiritually minded, they would frown at. But I think we need to uh, not be afraid to tackle these things head on and see if we can repurpose them. You know, art has always been able to raise consciousness. And I feel the opportunity to cause someone to look more deeply into what's being said, to spend the time to understand is what art is able to do. I mean, we can have it for the pleasant look or maybe they're we're looking at landscapes and flowers, but we can also have art that pricks the consciousness. And a lot of the art is able to do that. And I think that art that speaks in terms of what's going on today is saying to the viewer, stop. Take some time, see, hear what I'm trying to say. Let's have a conversation. It opens that opportunity for a discussion. And I think that's what's so important. And I'm thinking in terms of that question, that's what art lends itself to do. And black art, social justice, all these things are saying to us, to the public, stop, listen, engage, be a part of, be aware of. That's what art's about. Thank you. And I saw your hand too. Thank you, Dr. Trotty. That was great, Dr. Trotty. I just wanted to say, um, I have used Mammy and do use Mammy in my work. And I see it as reclaiming her power. I have a piece that I did called Because of Her I Am. Because in my family and a lot of people that I know, their great grandmothers, they were mammies. That's, they had to raise other families before they could go home and raise their own. I tell my students, you know, mammy was the first supermodel. Her picture was everywhere. We didn't like how they portrayed uh, her, but she was everywhere. And I think, again, you, you, when, you, when you know better, you do better and you learn over time um, of the power of who she was. And we have to look past her being presented to us so derogatory to understand that smile and her pain. A Different World is my all-time favorite TV show. And remember they had that one episode about Kim and the mammy, and then they related it to ego tripping with Nikki Giovanni and all of that. So um, 
I think you can reclaim these images and give them power, which is something I try to do. To that point, though, and I'm, I'm going to, to go to Mr. Hudnall, too, to see if he has any comments about it. But to Anne's point, this idea of transcending, right, the transcendence, in order to be able to transcend something, you have to be willing to engage in a process. And if we're constantly looking just to a product, Michelle Barnes taught me this. If we're constantly looking to, to a finished product to feel good about or to, uh, to hang on the wall or to, to, to exhibit, then if that's the priority and we refuse to look at the process, then we're missing out on the most important part. So art is conscious raising. But it's not the product that raises the consciousness necessarily. I mean, uh, to Mr. Hudnall's point, the, the viewer gets whatever he or she gets out of the piece, but it's the artist's process in making the piece that raises his or her level of consciousness to create the next and the next to evoke certain feelings from his or her you know, prospective audiences. Um, and we can't transcend necessarily. I mean, humans typically don't have the capacity to transcend their experiences and their own processes. We're only as good as, our, or, or we're only as much as our processes, I would think. What do you think about that? Um, Mr. Dunn, I mean, to your point about- well, uh, As simple as I can put it, art is life. It's based upon our own personal experiences that we have. And as we create and we present that to our audience, it's up to them to come to their own conclusion based upon their experiences. They can identify with it of wherever you go, uh, the things they've been exposed to. And these are, and, and, and this is the gut or the sacrifices that we make in order to create. And when we create, we have to have confidence in what we are creating despite not wondering what, how someone is going to receive it, but it's an expression of yourself that has to come out and hopefully the viewer can come to his or her own conclusion. And this is what is so important. And the most, next most important thing, uh, the cheerleader for us is our patrons, the person who believe in what we are doing. They are the cheerleaders that takes it out and spread the word to other people due to the fact that we don't have the time to, if you're being creative, you don't have the time to be out there promoting yourself other than you promote through other people. And when other people see your work, then the word is passed on and it's passed on and it's passed on. And then this is how we begin to exhibit. This is how we begin to flourish. This is how we begin to gain some sort of recognition if that's what you want. But it all goes back to the simple word that art is life. And these expressions that we uh, put out for people to view and based upon their personal experiences, some good, some bad, but yet and still this is our creativity, it evolves out of that. I'm going to allow uh, each of the panelists if they are interested uh, in doing so to offer a a, a summary idea uh, before we close and I want to make sure that I have time to allow them to talk about their recent projects and things that they're working on right, right now. Some of them are exhibiting in the month of October and some of them are, will be exhibiting through December and I want to make sure that um, that we feature some of the slides so our viewers can look at the websites and get more information about what's coming up. So uh, starting with Ms. Barnes are there any concluding statements that you'd like to make about the importance of black art at this time and um, you know, how black art factors into this larger conversation about black lives mattering? The art and creativity that is expressed and manifests itself um, by members, various members of our culture, whether they, we deem ourselves artists or not, we're creative beings, um, matters in the long term. It matters also in the immediate short term. So what we do is life. It is life giving, uh, life supporting, hopefully. 
Um, There's, there's so many things to say. It's just, um, life is art. Life is, uh, art is autobiographical as well as um, expressive. It, it, it is about what we value, what we prioritize, what we care about, how we want to live our, di our lives, um, and how we want to die. Nathaniel, I agree with you. Um, it's part of the cycle. The collective will continue to contribute, produce, support, uh, evolve through our programs in education, exhibition, community development, and entrepreneurship. We value all creativity we want to focus on the African-American artists so that the artist representations can be valued uh, and representative as authentic, as the authentic work that they are. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Trotty. I would just like to mention some things that I'm working on right now and they very much involve uh, the community. With this COVID experience that we have, mental health has become a very important concern. And at the Community Artists Collective, we are putting on a telethon in November, on the 7th exactly, that deals with uh, the mental health of our community. And we've asked experts to make statements and provide our uh, resources. We have performers who are, are sharing their skills to uplift the community because that's an important aspect of all lives and certainly of, of Black lives as well. And I'm also very much interested in the cultural history of what's going on. And so at the Rutherford Beach Yates Museum, we're looking at telling those stories through architecture and the people who lived in the fourth ward, uh, one of the earliest communities in Houston. And then of course, I certainly can't forget the importance of those murals at Texas Southern University. The murals that if we want to begin to consider telling the stories and looking into social justice, you just have to walk through Hannah Hall and other buildings on that campus and see those stories that have been told over the last 50 years through the visual art of the students who experienced them because they were dealing with their experiences during that time. And though the times may have changed, each generation was able to communicate what life was like living in a black community during their time. So I encourage those of you who have an opportunity to do so, to also take a look at those murals at Texas Southern University. Brandy, if you could, can you um, advance the slides for the collective so that the audience can see those images uh, at the end of the, at the very end? Okay, uh, while, we're, while those images are coming up, uh, Mr. Hudnall, what do you have on tap? Uh, wow. Uh, at um, Photographs Do Not Bend in Dallas, Past and Present is an exhibit that is there. Uh, at the Jewish, at the Holocaust Museum, uh, Archetypes of My Childhood uh, opens on the 27th of this month, October the 27th. And I just finished a piece for the Washington Post based upon the life of George Floyd. And there was a piece in the Time Magazine, uh, the August issue of uh, community, uh, capturing community. Uh, they ran an eight page spread there and an online version. And 
this is what I'm working on at this particular time. Trinity University, their, their School of Architecture had a publication to come out and they used the picture Flipping Boy from Fourth Ward that shows the historical uh, Freemanstown, how it is just a position against the skyline of the city of Houston. And that publication is coming out just as of now. And that is about it. Need to get in a dark room and make some new images. And hopefully I can do that in the near future. Well, that's a lot. Um, so please do visit the collective.org. Um, and I'm, I'm fairly certain that we can provide those viewers who are interested with the, the websites to artists' work. Uh, and what do you have on tap? Thank you. Uh, before I say anything, I hope this has been great. I just want to say thank you again for putting this together. And I think those three words that Dr. Trotty said, stop, listen, and engage, I hope you all out there take that with you. That was powerful. Um, I do an Art as Activism lecture series at Prairie View. I have one coming up the 29th of this month in a few weeks. It'll be a Zoom lecture. Um, I am in an exhibition in Fort Collins, which is near my hometown uh, of Cheyenne, Wyoming, at the Center for Fine Art Photography called The Right to Herself. That opens next week. And actually it's in two places and it's on the campus of Colorado State University and then at the Lincoln Arts Center in Fort Collins. And then finally, my students and I are working on a project. We received a grant um, to create, um, oh, that's for the uh, Fort Collins exhibition, uh, to create furniture uh, for the Brazos Valley African American Museum in Bryan, Texas with Texas A&M. And my incredible students have designed and are fabricating furniture based off African Adinka symbols. And those will be revealed in December. Oh, absolutely wonderful. Um, that, that sounds amazing. I can't wait to see that. Um, Brandy, I'm sorry, I did not go in alphabetical order. So Nathaniel, Nathaniel's exhibits are just before Anne's. Apologies, audience. So Nathaniel, go ahead while she's loading those. Go ahead and, and, um, and speak to what I have on tap. Right? That's it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm currently working on a larger project that has different components in it and the, uh, the gist of the project is how do you make an argument or a uh, proposition to support artist life through art the art process and art making and real briefly um, the subject is third fourth and fifth ward Houston Texas and the different types of uh, negotiations and navigations that uh, people from those communities had to or are going through under the, the larger scope of, co of community and uh, things that happen. So ways that you think about living and how to live. So I'm pairing that up with um, creating works in a studio, putting works in the public, and these works inform each other and they're documenting and they move to different stages. So from studio to the public, which is what you, what you want to show, public artwork to uh, online sound, uh, video, um, an online magazine, and finally uh, uh, one single book as an object. And all those different stages replicate this idea of fugitivity and moving through space. And so what I'm trying to argue with the act of making the work versus arguing like rhetorically or arguing written or arguing uh, or, or, or trying to prove in a mathematical equation, I'm trying to, do, trying to do it through the process of art making. So what you're seeing right now is one of the parts of the, the, uh, the um, project. And that's, that's in front of the Contemporary Arts Museum and they wanted a public art they wanted something, they doing some construction and they had these fences and they wanted public art to be um, a part of it. And so they invited me to, to do it. What they wanted or what they was expecting is a reactionary piece. And what I wanted to show was a piece about a bigger, a bigger, a bigger blackness than just being reactionary. 
the bigger blackness is not only responding to violence, the bigger blackness is also responding with each other in terms of exchange, social exchange, where I exchanged uh, uh, with students from third, fourth, and fifth ward backpacks and gave them new backpacks for their old backpacks. So that type of community exchange, uh, the historical element of bigger blackness. So you see this, these four guys, this image right here is the four guys that did the uh, protest. Well, it was more than them, but they sat in in, in wine gardens and the cars are uh, slab, you know. So I'm, 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 I'm putting past and present together to make one image, right? So this thing is about that too. So the bigger blackness is not just for me, speaking for myself, it's not just about uh, just responding to that. We're plur pluralistic. So we got many, many angles like the sun, all kinds of rays shining. So that's the project I'm working on. So it, it'll probably be, be finished uh, maybe in uh, November. And that's gonna be at the Contemporary Arts Museum. Um, and to our viewers who may not know, Kanitra Fletcher, who is a Rutgers grad, is the, um, is the curator. For... No, no, no. That's, okay. that's at the, that's the MFA. MFA, MFA, yeah. okay. So the cam, the cam is this guy named uh, 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 Hesse. Yeah. Okay. What? To, okay. So you have to give me that information. That's right. She's at. She's at MFA. But I'll be doing a talk at the MFA too for five A though. Okay. Okay. So that's the connection. All right. So we look forward to that. Thank you so much. Um, I know that there's some overlap between you and Lance. Lance, you're also going to be participating in Friendly Fire. Can you talk to us about that? Correct. Um, yeah. I just. I. Um, I've always liked the work of Robert Hodge. We've collaborated a couple times on different projects. Michael too. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just contributing to his, his overall um, larger project. I'm excited about that. I, I believe it, it's out for order uh, on vinyl day, which is at the end of this month. Uh, I know Cactus Music will have the project. Um, I'm also working with a uh, young artist in Houston named Peyton. Uh, Peyton is uh, from Missouri City. Uh, you might say she's a fixture in Third Ward too. Great, great artist, phenomenal. Uh, she's signed to uh, Stone's Throw. So she's coming through that lineage of Jay Dilla and Mad Lib. And very soulful. Um, working with her is, is a delight. Um, I also have my own solo visuals, uh, Fangs Come Down, which I'll be premiering uh, probably closer to uh, the beginning of 2021, but I'm working on, I'm working on it now. And uh, I'm also working with a young artist named Anna, who's uh, also an amazing artist from Colorado uh, and very conscious of who he is and what he has to contribute to the overall uh, panoramic view of, of Black people as a whole. His uh, project will be called Color Files. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you for having me. And I love everybody here. We're all great. Thank you. Leo, what do you have going on? You're pulling up the rear, but you're not least. OK. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll first like to give a quick shout. I want to give a quick shout out to the to the other artists on the panel. It's something I was just thinking earlier, but then found a space to say. Um, which is there's something really like the answer to the intellectual thing was like there's so much nuance and like greatness in the work of the artists on this panel. Um, like to look at early Hutton's work and to see how he saw, and I know nobody else saw that at that moment, and how consistent he's been in seeing stuff nobody else saw, like. <clears throat> The way that Anne puts together like gentle and power and like the same word, not even like 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 this this there's something that Nathaniel does with materials. Like if you've never seen the way Lance's pencil marks and his pen marks go together to give you a drawing, like you like there's something there that everybody has found through the process of making art. Um, and when you ask me, like I guess what I'm trying to do right now is uh, I'm trying to do like the 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 impossible. Like there's something impossible about what we try to reach. So I'm trying to make work that does something that I don't know if can happen or not. Um, 
And as a teaching practice, I, like Ann, I created a class at the school I'm at uh, called Art and Activism and then merged it with one called Digital Futures. And what I try to teach in that class is, um, or let me change it, not teach, provide a space for the students to learn mm -hmm. is how they can use technology to articulate their voice and find power and make structures in both virtual, real, three-dimensional, et cetera. Um, but the dilemma with that is something that's part of my overall art practice, which is access. And a lot of the things I do aren't accessible to the people that I would want to expand that accessibility to. So I'm trying to find the funding, find the spaces, find the partnerships to expand who has access to like, like I didn't go get this education and spend all this money so I could just be smart by myself. Like, let me go gather all these experiences and share it off and dish it to some people who, can, who got more energy than me uh, and, and, and just get it out there. Like, like basically like strip the academy of this knowledge and disperse it to the people, right? Um, travel the world and tell people where stuff is, like those kind of things. Um, and then hopefully I'll get a show at some point in time and I can share like some objects on the wall and maybe like spit a poem and like, I don't know, coordinate movement, you know? So that's what's up. Oh, that's, that's a word. I love it. Okay. Awesome. I'm so excited. Um, I don't know if, if those of you who are still viewing with us understand, um, that the majority of the artists, if not all of them have ties, they're all connected. Um, we are native Houstonians and, um, it's just a microcosm of what's going on in the world. You know, black artists are connected all over the world. And I'm hoping that, this will initiate a conversation to extend visibility to artists who might not have these kinds of opportunities and, um, you know, to reconnect us in a, in a virtual way, um, despite our being disconnected by this pandemic. I think it's still important to talk about Black art, see Black artists, and communicate the function and the, and the power of Black art, even though we're not able to get out, many of us, and see it for ourselves. So um, thank you so much for joining. Us Dr. This. Benson. Yes. I wanted to just oh, tell oh, him. Ricardo, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That's my that's my it's okay. I'm I'm always the last to lie. I love you though. I love you. <laughs> no no slight. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh I wanted to thank all of the participants in this. This has been just a treat. It really has. I mean, some of you all I haven't seen in years. So I'm so happy and uh like definitely Mr. Hudnall. I've seen your work for years. I've been such an admirer of, your, of what you do. And to be able to be in the same meeting with you uh, is an honor. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, we should all exchange how we can keep in touch with each other. I agree. I agree. Yes. Um, I have a few things going on this Saturday. I have a Zoom event with Michelle, uh, the Community Artist Collective. Um, it is uh, part of their entrepreneurship uh, Zoom series, um, and I will. It will be with a fellow curator friend of mine, Rafael Coelho, who is based here in Newark, New Jersey. Very excited for that. Uh, the videogra videographer for that will be Gene Sonderand, who is a, a new friend of mine. Um, right now, working on a show for the collective for January 2021 called 2020. Uh, it's about COVID and the Black Lives Matter uh, movement at the present moment. So I'm excited uh, to be producing that at the present moment. And We the People is live now. I'm going to hype that up as much as I can. www.wethepeopleartshow.com. It's a virtual show. There's video presentations. There's music. There's you, young artists uh, and artists from everywhere uh, here in America here locally, around the world. There's, there's definitely some artists from Houston that are in this project. Uh, definitely everybody go out and check that out. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of, of other stuff going on or happening. Uh, as soon as it uh, comes to being, I'll let everybody know. Awesome, thank you so much, everyone. And um, please do go to the Rutgers University website for the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute and view the individual artist interviews to learn more about their work. And um, we look forward to holding similar panel discussions in the future. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.